Grandmama used to pray, oh Lord, please save them from the evil snares and all the dangers that entangle. Yeah, though they walk in through the valley of the shadows, just prepare and make them fit for every battle because but I know they're bound to come and I know they're bound to fall. But in your bounty, Lord, preserve their beautiful home. Right. We still survive and offer grandma's prayers. Surrounded by the jungle and the lion's den. Tread light, cause these traps is inconspicuous. They hide right in plain sight. Thinking we don't see them when they linger. Look right beneath the surface. Then leave a trail of corpses. Crisis, prices, your life a disposable commodity. Like living in a fantasy condition to believe that the system even cares whether selling CDs or walking or driving a read. Look, they don't even need a reason. It's just your breathing and being black. When it's such a pretty fall, a pretty fall It don't seem like we falling at all, at all It's just a GMO dream Where things are never really what they seem Please kill the violins Tell them just to play me something pretty Cause this pretty city got me screaming bloody murder So they got me screaming This pretty city got me Got me on song, look, get your hand up on my pocket, distraction, so lazy they use the same tactics, like kind them with some trinkets, just don't let them get to thinking, that light bulb gets a blinking, you know niggas and ideas, oh dear, my dear, my dear, you may not know me, but I know you very well, for a side, for a sight, they say hindsight is 2020, well tell me something, we gotta see that history is on repeat, and maybe it takes a beat and a melody to speak a little louder than the message in the clouds, or the essence in the air i swear my god is just so clear that a system driven by fear can never give us nothing but more of the same things things oh when it's such a pretty fall a pretty fall it don't seem like we've fallen at all it's just a gmo dream where things are never really what they seem please cue the violins tell them just to play me something pretty because this gritty city got me screaming it's murder Got me screaming, got me. This gritty city got me, got me on song. What's happening, good people? We are live. RSTV. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, as your your homeboy, Mr. Rogers, would say. You know, and um, it's an excellent day to be black. Excellent day to be an African. Um, and I wanted to, um, what I wanted to do today. You know, I, I noticed y'all should notice that these people are just on the screen with me, like right away. Um, Today, I brought on a couple uh, of my cohorts, uh, some folks I respect in media. I think that uh, oftentimes when we talk about media and we talk about black power and culture and so on and so forth, we don't understand the importance of, uh, of, of, of this particular tool. Um, I want to uh, say first and foremost, um, salute to all the good folks out there that have been working hard and 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 trying to maintain throughout these trying times it is a constant battle but you know we're here and we're going to prevail in spite of ourselves so um today i wanted to bring on a few uh comrades and friends we have uh to my right and maybe to your left jackie luke mon one of uh my my favorite sisters on the planet. And I'm gonna say that right in front of her oh. face. I, I don't like too many people, you know that. But um, you know, definitely uh I wanted to bring Jackie Luke Mon on, who is a host of By Any Means Necessary on Sputnik Television. Or is that Sputnik Radio? Radio. Radio. Hey, Look we ain't right. on TV yet, we do. Hey, we're working on it, right? <laughs> so, you know, definitely Jackie Luke Mon, welcome. Uh Jackie Luke Mon is also a host here on Black Power Media. Uh, going clockwise, we have our newest member, one of the newest members of the Black Power Media family, uh, uh, Coco, and she's the host of Confronting Contra Contradictions. If you haven't seen that show, make sure you check that out. And last but not least, 
well, not actually last but not least, because we have uh, someone else that'll be coming on as well. But last but I mean, right now on the screen, we have uh, ah, my man, Davy D. And Davy D is an icon when it comes to social media, uh, particularly social media, radio and propaganda media, so on and so forth. You know, he's been pushing this thing going back to my knowledge, at least the uh, early mid nineties. So, um, you know, we, you all can make corrections as you will. Uh, welcome to the platform. Good people. Thanks for having us. No doubt. No doubt. Free the land. So, yes. It's great to be here. Yes. Yeah, free the land by any means. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted to, like I said, I respect all of your work. I know we have uh, Empress Chi in the background. When she turns her camera on, we'll, she'll be joining us as well. Um, who is uh, Empress Chi is a host of, of uh, a couple different radio shows. And I know she's also the founder um, of the original Million Women's March. So, you know, definitely, you know, salute to her. We'll be bringing her on once her camera is correct as well. Um, yeah. So I wanted to bring you folks on really to talk about your journey, what brought you to media. Um some of the things we know and don't know and um, you know, where we see it going from here. So I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, start with Davey since I introduced him last. Uh, give us a little bit of background if you don't mind Davey of, we know that you're the host of Hard Knock Radio. Give us some, some background of what brought you to media and you know, what type of syndication Hard Knock Radio is getting for folks who are not familiar right now. Well, I got into media in actually the mid 80s, around 86, 87. Um, and I got into it by accident. I was um, primarily DJing on the college campus at Berkeley. And there was a problem that they were having at the station. And I was asked to come in because I was part of a record pool and able to kind of uh, facilitate some of the contradictions that they were getting at the station versus what was happening. Um, I got trained uh, by some pretty powerful folks at the time and wound up doing radio shows there. And those radio shows led to me doing commercial radio, probably, you know, if there's uh, pop oriented stations, we were the brain trust behind the hot 97s and all that in terms of how they initially started. And uh, that was KML. So I was there, myself, Sway, King Tech, a whole bunch of us, Fred Reck, we all came in around the same time in 91. And simultaneously, I was doing a show on Pacifica, which I still do. Um, and that morphed into Hard Knock Radio. So we're in our 20, 21st year doing Hard Knock. And we're in about 10 cities. So that's pretty much it. Um, I do a lot of writing. And I'll just conclude in saying my writing opened up the doors for radio, you know, and I've always owned my publications. I've always owned my my media platforms and I've always used those to to, um, you know, to open up opportunities in other arenas. I also been on the Internet, uh, which I think you refer to probably in the early 90s. So I've been doing right. that early on. So that's it. You know, I, I forgot about KML, man. That that is like that was hip hop at its finest um, during eighties, during the eighties, nineties. So yeah, forgive me for that that slight. And I know you mentioned uh, Sway and Tech and all of those good folks during that time. To us on the East Coast, that was like one of, if not the premier, because we know it was getting that that national attention, and it kind of turned us on to what was going on the West Coast. So you know. And we didn't we didn't know at the time all the things we knew now, because um, we would sit in the you know sit in the room of those program directors and give suggestions and things like that. To the credit of Sway and Tech, um, they parlayed that and were actually uh, consultants for the stations. Eventually, you know, mm -hmm. I got into management, but I don't think anybody will ever give the full credit in in terms of what we were doing, especially when it moved in political directions. Um, you know, MC Hammer, who many people would know, uh, walked up in there and started a, you know, a prisoner show, you know, like, mm -hmm. how do we get people off the streets? And he started this thing called Street Soldiers that he hosted for a year. You know, the credit now goes to Joe Marshall, but it was Hammer who conceived and was able to leverage 
his uh, his popularity and influence, you know, to say, let's put this type of show and not at four in the morning. But we, we had all our shows at prime time, like nine to 11, you know, like Sunday evening from eight o'clock until and and those things, you know, like I said, we didn't know the intricacies of radio until later on. But but it was a, it was a good heyday, you know, um, in terms of what we did. And I think a lot was accomplished. And that, that was L.A., correct? No, that was here. You know, then the yeah, we, that okay. was in the Bay, yeah. and then everything wow. everything got syndicated down to L.A. because okay. they wanted to move it out this market into a bigger market, and you know that's radio that we didn't know. It's like, why can't you just stay here in the Bay? But you know, it was what it was. I stayed in the Bay. You know, okay. they they all went down to L.A. Okay, okay, so that that's where the confusion came because, yeah. like I said, I always thought it was uh, straight out of L.A. But definitely appreciate that um, tidbit. Uh, about MC Hammer, I think that's something that uh, most of us outside of that particular region wouldn't know. Um, so definitely, you know, salute for that. Jackie Lukman, you, um, you know, I, I know you on a, on a Russian radio station. <laughs> what? Yeah, uh, I'm, the, I'm the Black Russian. That's me. <laughs> what What got you into into uh, media as a whole, and then you know, take us to uh, your journey to Sputnik? Um, what got me into media, really, and as this is a story I tell often to anybody who would listen, was my marriage to Abdi Shahid Lukman. Um, mm -hmm. Our, the, the, the very creation of Lukman Nation as a platform, as a, as a media platform, uh, was Abdi Shahid Lukman's idea. Um, it was something that he nurtured as an activist himself, but long before he met me, probably long before it, it even had a name, he just, he was political, he was an organizer, even as he was uh, an imam uh, at the time, um, many years ago, um, he always had an interest in uh, conveying po politics from a Black working class perspective. And unbeknownst to him, so did I, as a Christian, um, becoming more of an organizer, becoming more politically aware. Neither one of us knew each other during those years when we were practically doing the same thing, him in New Jersey, me in Washington, D.C., until we met um, in 2012. Um, and just, you know, kind of fell madly in love. Neither one of us wanted to be where we were at a Christian singles retreat. Um, we met each other there, fell madly in love, got married in 2013. And his idea was, hey, let's start a social media platform where we, two Black uh, uh, working class people, can talk about politics because folks were getting involved, more involved in electoral politics and talking about issues that folks weren't talking about be before as Bernie Sanders' campaign was starting to kind of kick off as the Freddie Gray situation in Baltimore was happening, as you know, Mike Brown, what these kinds of things were kicking off and people were having public social media conversations about these issues, um, kind of trying to have a political conversation about them and, and failing because the black working class perspective, tying the history of our struggle into these emerging uh, modern uh, events, people were just were not making those connections. So, you know, he and I both very much uh, political junkies, very much lovers of history um, and, and very much lovers of our people, both Pan-Africanists, you know, both revolutionary minded, both Garveyites to some degree, um, both really on this kind of spiritual journey, but also, this political ideological journey towards socialism, kind of getting toward there, but but kind of feeling out what that means for us, you know, Africans in this part of the of the diaspora. He said, you know, instead of listening to all these white people talking about all these things going on, why don't we talk about it? And I was like, I don't what who's gonna listen to us? He's like, look, people can put, people have their shows on YouTube and on Facebook, you know, talking about their cats and, you know, putting dresses on their dogs and 
they can do that, surely two black people can talk about politics, you know. And we started it through blog talk, uh, blog talk radio. Um, this show called Coffee Current Events in Politics. He came up with that name too. Uh, on Blog Talk Radio for like a year and a half, we might have had two, three listeners, and and two of the listeners were two conservative black guys. One was in Indianapolis, and the other, I, if I'm remembering correctly, was in Detroit. And the third listener was was his dad, who <laughs> would never call in but would always say he listened. And uh, one of the shows we did that he remained the proudest of, and, and, and I am too, was our coverage of the indictments, the announcement of the indictments after the Freddie Gray uprising. Because we went to Baltimore and that was the first time he pushed me um, and we captured it on camera. That was the first time he pushed me to be kind of a journalist. And I wasn't, I had no experience with it. But his thing was, People are drawn to you, Jackie. People love to talk to you and you are very open and you just have conversation with people and people love talking to you. So do that. When we walk down the street in, in, in Baltimore, I want you to talk to people. I ain't know these people, y'all. We just, I, you know, we just walking down uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in Sandtown, just talking to people we met. And it was some of the best stuff that we had ever done. And that's how we started. We went from blog talk radio to doing our own thing on Facebook. And that caught the attention of an online outlet called Real Progressives that was very tied to the Bernie Sanders movement. We had to get away from them because of seriously bad internal politics, you know, uh, just typical white dude bro stuff in the background, sexism, racism, just, just ridiculous stuff. Abdus insisted that we keep our name, our platform. We didn't integrate with them. So we turned Coffee Current Events and Politics into Luke Mon Nation. And then we got the attention of the Real News Network and uh, got a contract with the Real News Network for a little while. And both of us were still working our regular jobs. I was a contractor for the SEC at the Securities and Exchange Commission. He was driving a truck we began to get the attention of shows on Sputnik. Uh, we were guests on all of the shows on the Sputnik radio network for probably two years. Um, and his, Abdus's, um, his mantra to me was, I don't care who calls. I don't care how many times a day they call, always say yes. If they want us to come on and talk about politics, always say yes, except maybe for if it's like Fox News, then we'll talk about it. <laughs> but otherwise, anybody calls always say yes. So we did. And the next thing we know in 2019, I get offered the spot to co-host by any means necessary on Radio Sputnik. We get offered the spot, I think, either the year before or that year to be a part of this new thing, Black Power Media. You know, Abda starts another venture called Waters of Healing that was that was a show focused toward black men uh, to talk about the issues that black men face that are really hard for black men to talk about. And as you know, history just kind of worked out the way it did that the way it was supposed to, for whatever reason, um, his legacy outlived him. Um, he passed away suddenly in 2021. Um, but here I still am doing this thing, whatever it is that that he he set me on this path to doing. And, you know, I, I'm, I couldn't be prouder of this this weight that I am. I am honored to carry. No doubt. That, that was definitely I'm glad you uh, gave us some some background on it, because, uh, you know, oftentimes we're, we're working together, but we don't know where we came from. You know what I'm saying? You meet a person at a certain space at a certain time, and sometimes you almost uh, naively or ignorantly begin their journey where you met them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So folks like, you know, they say, okay, well, she does this or he does that. And, you know, they don't know 
what it took to get you to to this particular arena. Um, so definitely appreciate that. Coco, talk to us. You know what what got you on this path? You know, you just walking down the street and you know, did you do like Jackie? You just ran up and down the Baltimore streets. So what what happened? That, that's exactly what happened, you know. Um, nah. <laughs> um, so I um, actually, my journey, I would say, started in college. You know, I went to um, uh, a CUNY, a city university in New York uh, school, which was called Mega Evers College um, in Brooklyn. Um, so I had entered school like um, a little later. I was about 26 years old. So um, I had a little bit of experience in life, you know, as far as like um, a lot of life. Um, experience before I went to school and I was in the English department there. And so I was actually approached by um, some other students to revive the student newspaper called the Adafi news newspaper. And so, um, so they got me involved and um, I started to learn and that's actually how my activism started. So we were um, fairly active on campus. We were uh, working to, you know, bring community to the campus. Um, we were trying to connect with the local community as well. Um, we were in Crown Heights. Um, so what we would do is um, we would, you know, have a lot of conversations about like some of the things, the issues that were going on on campus, a lot of the neoliberal um, agenda that was happening in the school um, and trying to like really resist. And we used the newspaper in order for us to um, you know, bring these ideas, like to spread the awareness of what was happening throughout the campus and throughout CUNY itself. Um, so that's kind of like where I started like thinking about journalism. Um, although I was, I was not trained. I didn't have any idea what I was doing, um, both in journalism and activism. But what happened during that time, um, I decided to switch my major. And so I ended up becoming, um, I, I actually got to do a, like a dual major where I was able to create my own major. And so I wanted to do community organizing and um, eventually it actually um, transformed into politics uh, for social change and communications. So I was taking a lot of communications classes and then um, obviously with my activism and my work that I was doing on campus, it was you know a combination of things. And so I ended up doing a, um, I started an internship, um, which was for the Left Forum Conference. So um, if anyone knows in New York City, there was a conference for, I guess, the left that brought um, a lot of the left um, together in New York City. And so I ended up becoming a co-coordinator of the media. And so in that, I was, you know, the organizer for media for the conference. And I was able to actually meet a lot of people, um, a lot of um uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like RT was there, RT News. And I got to like really know like the connection of propaganda, right? Like the importance of propaganda when when thinking about politics and thinking about how we spread um, our, our politics. This this is the time frame when I was becoming more aware of propaganda and ways that we can use it. And so um, that was, you know, quite a while ago. Um, and after that, I kind of started getting more involved um, actively um, with my politics, my politics started to transform. And, you know, I took a big break. I had my son. Um, and so uh, while I, after I gave birth to my son, it was a lone, it was a very lonely period in my life. And I got, um, and so when I was actually at Left Forum, I learned about Twitter, right? So this is back in like 20, you know, 14. I learned how to use Twitter. Actually, I started using Twitter in 2012, but I, I got a little bit more acclimated with it. Um, after the left forum conference. And so back, you know, I had my son and I decided to go onto Twitter. And so my Twitter account became, you know, a thing where I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of followers, but I started to propagate, you know, a lot of the, um, the messages that, or the politics that I was very interested in. And so that kind of garnered a lot of attention from people um, just based on like a lot of the, the work that I was doing on Twitter. And so that connected me to a lot of people, um, and you know, it got it got me connected to the prisoners' resistance movement. And so, um, from that period, I started to work um, with Jailhouse Lawyers Speak um, as a liaison, and from there, I started to do a lot more, um, a lot, a lot more work um, in between that. So I started to work on a lot of. Um, prisoners, um, political prisoners, new African prisoners, their campaigns, their freedom campaigns, 
um, started to work on a lot of various um, campaigns for you know human rights. And again, we had to do a lot of press releases. So I, again, a lot of this communications work that I did in college kind of helped to translate into the work that I was doing um, within the prisoners resistance movement. And then, um, and then I'm here now, you know, I'm still obviously active in, in our movements. I'm, very, I'm affiliated with various organizations, including um, Black Alliance for Peace, community movement builders, and um, within the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa. So um, throughout this time, I have started, I've done a lot of work with George Jackson University Radio. So I've co-hosted the radio several times and I've been a guest on the radio show as well. Um, and then obviously Black Power Media is, is my new home where I've, you know, I've guests and now I have my, my show Confronting Con Contradictions. Um, so I, I think for me, like, you know, just, you know, this journey, I, I, I never thought this journey would be, you know, so I didn't, I didn't really think anything of it. Like when I was in college, I didn't think of, you know, myself as a journalist. I didn't really necessarily think of my, myself as this communications major. Um, because again, like politics was a little bit more at the forefront of the work that I was trying to do. Um, and then I, you know, some form of activism, I guess you could say. Um, but then it, it just, it, it all makes sense now that I see it because it's all kind of a way to merge and how, how do we get our message across? And so obviously the work that I'm trying to do with confronting contradictions is to, you know, put forth a, you know, some, some form of like message, um, you know, to uh, confront contradictions, um, but to really like steer and guide, you know, uh, the way we think about, you know, the world around us and how um, the world around us impacts us, but doing it through a media perspective, right? And so even joining the the Remix Morning Show, you know, just being able to bring stories that I think are relevant. Um, a lot of times I'm, I'm not necessarily as active on Twitter. I, I've kind of closed off my Twitter and I'm not really very, um, you know, the people who know, they know, um, you know, that I'm on there. Um, but, you know, again, just making sure that bringing those relevant stories and, and really having a critical lens when it comes down to a lot of the, you know, neoliberal and um, oppressor nations agenda and just, you know, kind of making sure to, uh, to bring that. So I hope that uh, gets no, that, to, that, that, yeah. that was, that was, uh, no, nah, and I, I, again, I appreciate it because, you know, you got to the the root of what I think we all do this for in regards to um, one of the 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 reasons we're doing this particular episode in regards to the whole propaganda. Before I uh, move forward, I'd like to remind the chat uh, while we appreciate you all joining us here today. Please understand that this is not the Remix Morning Show, and that's not a diss, and it's not the the ha ha he he when you when we have. Our guests on here, respect is absolutely necessary. In fact, I demand and I command respect on this particular platform. And if there's any sign of disrespect, I will absolutely block you. OK, now, I don't mean to sound like no no type of czar or nothing like that. But I want to make sure that, you know, on RSTV and Guerrilla Intellectual University and other platforms here, um, you know, we're, we're not here to play no games. So please don't get I don't care who you are. You know, either show respect or, you know, go ahead and kindly, you know, you know, go ahead and walk. All right. Anyway, again, you're checking out RSTV. We have our guest, Davey D, uh, Coco, Jackie, Luke Mon. It looked like our, our next guest, Dr. Filet Chinosa was available. Nod your head uh, if you're ready. OK, cool in the gang. Here we go. What's happening, Dr. Filet? How you feeling today? You got you got your thing on mute. Let's unmute you. Stop. Okay. Okay. Try it one more time. Okay. We're gonna get uh Mama Valet in, in order over here in a second. She's uh working on her equipment. We're gonna bring her back on in about two two seconds. Um yeah, so for me, um, getting into uh, quote unquote radio was all about propaganda. You know what I mean? Um, I'm an organizer. I've been organizing for now 37 years, right? 
So I only got involved. Um, I, I was never a fan of being in front of the camera in particular. I was cool with the microphone because, you know, I got used to the microphone. But from afar, I would I admired journalists um, to my own admittance. Two of my favorite shows in the past couple decades was um, uh, Hard Knock Radio and I Mix What I Like. You know what I mean? Those are two shows that no matter what, if they called, then I was going to make it my business to hop on their particular platforms. Um, but I, I was always, I always felt that our own propaganda was necessary. I had my first show in 2006. It was called FTV Power Hour. And it was on Harambe Radio. So shout out to, uh, you know, our brother Delani Amon, who's an ancestor right now. Um, I know uh, uh, Flay had a show on there as well. And we're going to talk about him when we get, a, get a, bring her back on in a second. Um, so in 2006, that was like an internet radio station, which was kind of one of the pioneers. So I got my start on there. And then in 2014, my man Amon Jackson and I, we started a podcast called um, Contraband Classified, which was, uh, to my own admittance, kind of modeled after what Davey and, um, and and Jared was doing. You know, we had the underground hip hop, the politics, and you know, my own brand of cursing and all that. But um, from there, it was Renegade Culture uh, approached Kamau about starting a podcast. And that became Renegade Culture. And later on, maybe 30 something episodes in, we brought on the Ear Doctor. Um, and from there, I always dreamed of us having sort of our own conglomerates, right? Much like Davey. And, and my, my background was in promotions. So I understood the value of maintaining your brand. That way, if someone says we don't want you on our joint no more, you can take your take your equipment and go elsewhere. It wasn't about, you know, I'm on this particular platform. So now I have to start all over. This is what it is. And this is how we move. So I actually approached Jared about us teaming up to do some type of platform where we can combine efforts. And of course, here we are today, Black Power Media, Kamal, Air Doctor, Jared, myself, and you all. I'm saying all that to say how important to you all. I know that Coco mentioned propaganda. How important is propaganda in in our people's liberation movement? Filet, how you doing? Look like you're ready now. Greetings, greetings, Doctor Filet in the house. Yes, yes, yes. Glad all to right. see you on deck. Took took you a while. You walked all the way from Philly to for this one. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, for some reason, I had a, a problem getting in. Needless to say, you know, that happened. So I'm on my tablet. I have my laptop here, but my camera would not work on the laptop. And then with the tablet, you couldn't hear me. So we figured it out. So we're here. Hey, hey man. What did they say? Started from the bottom. Now we're here. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you don't mind, because we, we were, you know, we, we we're about. 30 minutes in, but you know, that's all good. You know, we here. Um, for folks who are unfamiliar with you and your work, um, you know, give us some background on how you got into media and also, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and kind of, uh, if you could touch on, you know, that, that big, uh, monumental event that you, uh, started that folks made an effort to hijack. We'll get more into that. Oh, later. yeah. And, and still make an effort. And the fact that I guarantee you, both of the sisters here and greeting sisters and brother, yes. I, I guarantee you, you don't know the history. You know little about the Million Woman March. That was intentional uh, because yeah. when I give you the history, you're going to go, what? And then the few historians that did decide to write about it wrote incorrect information. Never bothered to interview me or anything. So that's a whole nother story. But Going back to what, what Brother Kalanji said, uh, my name is Sister Empress Filet Chionesu. Yes, I do have an honorary doctor's degree now, Brother Kalanji. Uh, but, but, you know, how I got started in media, you know, you know you're going to really love this. Mumi Abu Jamal. Oh. I was a student at Drexel University. And I had a radio program called The Black Experience in Music. 
and we did mostly music, but I also did interviews and poetry and so forth. Mumia Abu-Jamal used to come to our campus to record his independent broadcast, which at that point was these little cassettes that he would take his stuff and he would send it out to independent media people. Even though he had a regular gig here in Philly uh, for the major uh, TV or radio, whichever it was, but he always had an independent entity and it was called Black Times Audio. So you see, for those who are kind of just getting familiar with Mumia, I used to sit and watch him as a student. I used to watch him take that, his, his tape recorder was like this big and he would talk into it. This is Mumia Abu Jamal. And I used to watch him. And in doing so, I realized that journalism was more than you, you going to school and taking some courses. Mumia would speak in the, in the tape recorder, cut it off, and then listen to it. Run it back, rewind it, and listen to it again. Run it back, rewind it, listen to it again, until it was just right, until the diction, the tone, all of what he was saying was just the way he wanted it before he would send it out. So I realized then this, this is more, and see, I wasn't trying to get into journalism. I was a religion major and a free law minor. So, I, so journalism was just something that I did and because I wanted to do something in the community because I was just coming into the culture. And that's a whole nother thing we need to talk about how there, there was this void after the 60s and what COINTELCO did. Well, there was a few that came after that period that really got involved in the movement, but we didn't have any guidance. I was one of those children. So I used to watch Mumia. And, and again, I was, I was much younger. So my point is, I got into journal, journalism or what we call communicators. We were communicators, you see. And, and of course, I knew Brother Del Jones. And if anyone knew him, we called him the war correspondent, That's right. you see. They were all in our community. So we literally had a black community, y'all. Now, all this stuff y'all seeing now, this to me is foreign. All this other, and don't get me wrong, I work with many people. I do stuff in the United Nations, so I have to. But there's a very distinct area about some things that we do not mix in with that. And we make it clear, and we have the right to do that. So my point is, we had a black community here in Philly. We had the hood, which was our community, no matter where it was at. It could have been part of the suburbs. It was still the hood. It was a part of our community. The point is, Mumia used to walk through our community, sit on the step with his son on his back. He used to carry his son on his back, right? Um, and so that was kind of my more of introduction to journalism watching Mumia, listening to Mumia, being around Mumia. So again, I knew him before December 9th, 1981. In fact, my, my middle son was born, I was still in college, he was born March 12th, 1981. His name and ceremony was in June. And so when the elder said, who will take care of this child if his father cannot? It was Mumia Abu-Jamal that stood up and said, I will. So when I listen to people talk about Mumia, I, I always kind of laugh and say, yeah, okay. But some of us knew him before uh, December 9th. And this is why we have continued to fight. So again, when you hear Brother Kalanji talk about, I was in uh, the Harambe family uh, when it was in existence. And again, we always talked about political prisoners. We always made sure that those who were fighting for us, who, who paid a severe price, um, we made sure Dr. Matula Shakur, uh, at that time when we first started Harambe, I don't believe Iman Jamil was incarcerated at that time. But the point is, we've continued to, to do that. And by the way, this past Friday, uh, we were blessed to get a call from the Africa family and we were asked to interview Ramona Africa this past Friday. 
So we, you know, again, we have a history and a legacy that people tend to, um, it not, if not just admire, appreciate because we deal with integrity and they know that. And we've been there on that front line. Now, to fast forward to the Million Woman March, that's why, again, I laugh and I say, hmm, why is it people don't connect the black dots? How is it that the largest gathering in the world of any women anywhere ever is not something that most either know about, care about, and definitely don't support, even though we've always said we were going to develop it into a movement. And so I, I say, you know, people celebrated yesterday, Mother's Day, some white woman named Anna Jarvis, but yet when we talked about the mother of civilization, it's like we're talking a foreign language. <laughs> so when the sisters talk about contradictions, oh, we gonna really go into that one. What else you wanna know, Brother Kalanji? Hey man, look here, man. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you're here today. Set me straight. <laughs> so I, I, I got all, all the bad guys. Davy D's over here, like man, Kalanji now got me on here with the with these uh <laughs> ruffians. <laughs> but um, nah, I, I definitely um, I think we appreciate the history. Where else can you go and and hear about MC Hammer talking about prisoners and Mumir mm -hmm. recording on his on his uh on his uh cassette tape? You know what I'm right. saying? <laughs> Only here on the same show. Um, to to your point and to what we were getting at, and I appreciate you you know dropping what you just dropped. We'll get more into that, but I want to know um because I know like with Davy coming from a quote unquote hip hop background, right? Um, your show in the '80s, I, I guess it would it was more primarily hip hop politics mix. No, it was it was always hip hop and politics. Right. In right. fact, it started off um, with a guy named Natty Prep, who was from L.A., um, okay. who fought, you know, I mean, literally to get this uh, Sunday morning show. It started off as a pro-black, pan-Africanist um, political show. And, of course, part of our language is culture. So hip hop, of course, was going to be infused with it as well as everything else. Um, so we all were trained under that. And if you talk to the late Natty Prep, you know, he was very clear that uh, the infusion of our cultural language and our political language always have been side by side in terms of radio. So um, it wasn't an unusual thing. I grew up that way. You know, he knew that. And all of us did that naturally. We ran into... Um, brick walls as we got our shows because in different structures, the, the, the thing was like, are you just going to do music or are you going to talk? You know, you can't do both. You know, that became kind of the thing, but we were able to maintain that. And even on the commercial outlet, that became kind of the thing too, you know, um, infuse the music with the politics, you know, and, and, and keep it moving. Um, now, today, because our show is maybe an hour, you know, but we're on daily, uh, you know, we, we tend to just kind of do mostly the politics. But, of course, we bring everybody on. And if, if we have the artists on, we have a full on hour conversation, cover everything. It's, you know, it's what we do naturally. And I, I, I don't see any, you know, I don't see anything unusual about it, although when you get into certain places, they find it unusual and they want to put you in one to the other. Um, I'll give an example. When I was doing the morning show, we had a new boss once it became Clear Channel and he pulled me into the room. He said, you got to decide, are you going to be funny or are you going to be serious? Well, it's like our people are both, you know? And it's like, well, I need you to decide to do one or the other. Because if you want to do funny, then you can be on the morning show. But if you want to be serious, I got to take you off. And I pointed out that, you know, the other hosts who are mostly white and others, they had the full range of emotions and, and you know, social experience to convey to listeners and to, con and to bring on to themselves. But it became very clear that the role that us as Black people were going to be in many situations was one-dimensional. And you had to figure out how you were going to navigate that. So, you know, I didn't do the morning show after a while. I rather had done my, you know, my... Um, the uh, street knowledge show that I was doing 
And that was that, even though I proved that you can do both. And it was in fact necessary to do both. And that's the history of us doing both. But again, when folks have demographics and ratings and, you know, and a propaganda system of their own, um, you know, they're going to stick to that script and, uh, and move it in particular ways that often run roughshod, you know, run in opposition to what we ideally want and need. But now, now the the thing I, I found I find fascinating. I mean, I know some of the guests you've had on the show, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you get a cat like a Daruba, um, uh, a Boots, you know, and and I mean, countless others. I'm talking about. We, we mean, were the we were the first show to have um, uh, what's his name, Gary Webb on. Gary Webb mm-hmm. got to jump off because the first show that he did with him and Maxine Waters, the nation, and everybody else. In fact, he got lost coming to the station, but it was because we were number one in that market that uh, the CBS affiliate where my intern at the time worked at and had him tune in, that that legitimized it. It's like, well, if he's on that show, then we can do it, and that, that was the kickoff. But <laughs> we, we've always had that type of you know lineup. The, the thing is, is that what do you ask people when you have them? You know, what's the conversation when you have them? So I can have a Boots Riley on. I could have so-and-so up the street. And there's always going to be a a, an angle that's going to go above and beyond. I got a new album out, come by, you know, which is what they often want you to do when you are in particular situations. But, you know, we'll talk about everything that is under the sun that that can be relevant. Um, You'd be surprised the wisdom that people have. You'd be surprised of how deep they can be when you give them the opportunity, you know, right. to speak and, and share their, um, their outlooks. You know, I think we put, we, we, even all of us, we've run into the mistake of putting people in boxes and some of the best conversations I've had have been with people who you wouldn't expect. And, uh, and when I have the Darubas and everybody on, I think they underscore and, and give a certain type of gravitas to a political direction that we should ideally take that people would have been like, oh, I didn't know we can go this way, but you know what? I can connect the dots between what he said and what, you know, somebody who had an album out, but you didn't know they could really get, um, they had a, a, a political bent on or angle on particular topics. No doubt, no doubt. Jackie, okay, Russian radio. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny to be to be like laughing. Two different at. extremes right here. I'm, I'm just like you got you got Davy D, you know, and he's like, look, we're gonna talk about this on mainstream radio and be in ten different markets, and then you're like, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna hook up with the Russians, literally. <laughs> talk I about mean, that. like how does that it, work? You know, it's it, it's not. It's funny to be laughing about it because, of course, like last year. Uh, after, uh, you know, Russia finally responded to, you know, to the since 2014, the U.S. and NATO aggression toward it in Ukraine, which is not at all how mainstream media wants people to understand this conflict. Um, you know, for a year, we were we were terrified that we wouldn't have a job, just like, you know, RT was shut down in, in the freest country in the world, the country that's supposed to be built on these principles of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Entire uh, networks were shut down in this country. RT was closed. Uh, there was the American affiliate for Russia today. Uh, uh, Chinese outlets were effectively banned on social media, shut down. You couldn't find them anymore. All of Sp- uh, Sputnik shows that were on YouTube, uh, because we have a live hour that was booted off of YouTube. Um, press TV, we were, Iranians, Iranians. Yeah, the uh, yeah. press TV was booted off. We were booted off of all of the um, uh, podcast platforms, couldn't find our shows on. Apple, iTunes, Spotify, none of those places, right? In the freest country in the world. And the reality is that the kind of politics I talk about, the anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, uh, pan-Africanist, international solidarity politics, I talk about that we built our platform on, you know, because Abdus and I understood what we would need to do on social media to grow our platform 
especially during 2016, the Bernie Sanders, all we had to do was talk about the things Bernie Sanders was talking about, right? And we would get all these white people to, to come to our platform, but we didn't want to talk about that because we understood that those conversations excluded the Black experience in even progressive politics, just to, to the exclusion of how politics, even Bernie Sanders' good platform impacted us and left Black people in particular um, wanting, even if some of his policies were implemented. So we, we, it wasn't a decision that we said we would talk about those things. As Pan-Africanists, as internationally uh, uh, you know, focused solidarity folks and understanding that this capitalist system did not serve our people and understanding that Bernie Sanders has some good ideas, but even those good ideas that that rising tide lift all lifts all boats bullshit, we knew that was bullshit. We understood that there was nothing else we could talk about other than, okay, fine, this is the, the way that this system could go, but this is why even that direction isn't good enough for the rest of us. Our platform was about the rest of us. So when we get an offer by a, a foreign outlet, news outlet, to have this voice on a program on the network that was already a movement program created by Black movement people about people's movements in the U.S. and around the world. That's what by any means necessary is. It was just like, what, what else are we going to do? How, how do we turn this down to... to to have a bigger platform to tell our story, to talk about our people and the way politics affects our people and how we can fight, how our people can fight for our liberation. How do you turn that down just because it's the Russians? You don't, particularly when you know you are not gonna be offered as many times as people were like, oh, Jackie, I can see you on CNN. The hell you will. You ain't gonna never see this face on CNN. Not, not saying these things and trust and believe I will never convey or carry or, or uh, um, uh, a broadcast the, the State Department line, the imperialist line, the corporate media line to get that CNN paycheck because that's what I'd have to do. But I can't do that because then I'd be betraying not only the principles that my late husband and I started this thing on, but I'd be betraying our people because we all sit here on this platform and in our different platforms and our different ways, talk about exactly that thing, how this system does not serve our people. And, and there is no amount of betraying that, um, betraying the need to tell our people's story and how we're not being met by every policy that exists within the context of this system and how those policies affect our people all throughout the diaspora and how those policies affect every iteration of our people that exist, however we exist, however we express ourselves as Black African people. So, so that that is like what I do on, on, in Luke Mon Nation, it is precisely what I do on By Any Means Necessary, whether it's the Russians or somebody else, I don't care. This is what I'm going to do. It's what the breath in my body is, has put, been put in my body to do. And if the Russians are going to pay me to do it, fantastic. The day they stop paying me to do it, I'll keep doing it for free because I've been doing it for free. You feel me? The, and, 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 there is always a cost, right, to, to do this, to have these principles in this society, to challenge this society and the way it, it does not exist to serve our people. Because in a way, that, that's one of the reasons I don't have do segments on the Real News Network anymore, because their position on Ukraine wasn't my position on Ukraine. And, and I wasn't going to change my position on Ukraine based on the facts that I know are true. So, yeah, I, I will definitely do this for free and absolutely turn down a paycheck in order to stick to my principles. Because at the end of the day, 
y'all and, and Kalanji and everybody watching, I answer to not just the legacy of my husband, my ancestors, my own principles that my family and the history of my people's struggle have literally shaped. I answer to the people. And, and God forbid if one day my people are like, oh, she sold out for that paycheck. God we, forbid. <laughs> we would hate to see that, Jackie. And we appreciate you working over here with us at Black Power Media because we know that you ain't getting nothing but the big bank Hank bucks over here. You know what I mean? I know you <laughs> You good on this side, boy. You know what I mean? David was thinking about quitting his job. Like, look here. I don't have to teach no more. I'm just going to come to Black Power Media and we're going to eat some of this good air. Anyway. <laughs> well, you see right there, you're being very funny. You need to pick a side. Either be funny or be serious. <laughs> because we can't, we, can't, we can't do both. Yeah, we can't do both. You know, we can't do both, man. You know? Yeah, man. Listen, I've, I've been fired before. That's why I never put myself in a position where I could be fired again. You know what I'm saying? So understand that. Um, real quick, Coco. Um, how important is black power in media? Because I think that, you know, when we talk about Africa, we talk about blackness and black power. We're in a society right now where you have to water down your thoughts and feelings to appease to everyone else. You know what I'm saying? I am unconditionally African. I make no, no, no uh, excuses. You know, I'm not colored. I'm not a people <laughs> of color. You know what I'm saying? None of that. I'm an African. And whoever, mm -hmm. big nose, big lips, all that. You know what I'm saying? Loving it. I would never be anything other than that. I need to know from you how important is is our culture, how important is black power when it comes to media? Because it's a thin line uh, between um, love and hate. What you got for us? I mean, it, it's it's essential, right? I, I And I, I couldn't stress it enough, even from my own perspective, even from my own experience, how when you're in someone else's home and their own space, right? You have to you have to play the, by their rules, right? And so, if we are constantly in the oppressor space and the in the oppressor's house, how can we even have a voice? How can we even um, develop a message that is necessary for the masses of people to hear the accurate details, the message that needs to be heard, right? Um, there's so many times that even when you know, I mean, it's very clear and evident that the story is not going to be told according to those on, in the struggle, right? Whether you are you know, struggling in your own hood, whether you're struggling against the police, whether you're struggling against you know, any type of uh, corruption, the message that is, 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 portray is portrayed matters, right? And so if we are constantly, if our voices are silenced, if, if we don't have access to our own media, then how are we going to actually get the message across that is accurate, right? And this and this is this is this is a dire need because of accuracy, right? Um, uh, and and just to give a, a quick story, right? Um, you know, I I just I just recently edited a video, um, you know, for a study group, and it was um a it was a speech of by Malcolm X, right? And it's it's called the Black Revolution. I'm sure you could find it, you know, here and there on YouTube. Um, but I, I actually edited this video. And so while I was editing the video, um, I, I started to uh, compare it to a book called Malcolm X Speaks. And while I was, um, while I was comparing, I started to see the, dras the drastic contrast to the actual words that were spoken by Malcolm X and what was edited out in this, this book, right? And so when I, you know, I have, it's a, it's a first edition, right? And so we have to think about the context of when it was written and who it was edited by. It was edited by a white man, right? Mm. And so there were certain things that got edited out that I, 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 I was, it was to me like Malcolm X Speaks, the actual book, was is 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 a is a great book. You know, you read it and you really get a you know a, a very clear understanding of you know um, Brother Malcolm's 
uh, his his politics, his perspectives, especially at the time frame after um, leaving the NOI. But to learn that the editing process took out very key, very important details that only someone who is actually in the struggle would notice, right? The manipulation that has happened just based in, and, and obviously the speech itself is not readily available. It's not like you can just, you know, even the, the versions that are online are, is, is, is very, you know, not so good, right? But just the idea that how many people have probably purchased the book, how many people have read the speech and don't even know that there are certain words and certain uh, nuances that are missing from that and the message and how sometimes these, even these little details can get, can take a message, can take an actual speech and, and, and alter it. Right. And so now, you know, to me, I think it's it again, it's very important that, you know, we have our own space, you know, to really, you know, to to really steer the conversation, to steer um, the 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 politics. Right. To help people to really have a, a, a deeper rooted understanding of 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 you know, what it means to be African, to be new African, right? To, and, and not to necessarily go again in line with, you know, the liberal agenda, the neoliberal agenda, right? And so I think it's, it, it's, it's crucial, especially someone like myself, you know, I came from, again, uh, a movement of, you know, prisoners resistance movement. And so, you know, a lot of times, and, and, and what, you know, if anyone hasn't known, a lot of times, you know, when you, when prisoners are inside, they don't have a voice. They don't have a, a, a way, right, to communicate freely because of censorship, because of repression, especially if you're political. And so the message is, is, is extremely important. But what happens is when we're relying on, you know, liberal media to tell those stories, again, they choose whether or not it's important. They choose whether or not you know, what they want to say and what they want, they don't want to say. If you, you can go out and I've done interviews where I've, I've given a whole, a whole context, you know, a whole, a whole, and, and, and five words with, you know, it, it gets, becomes cherry picked. Right. And so then there's certain details that were, that are missing. And so those details, we, you know, are very important. So, you know, again, like when you're, when you're thinking about even messaging, um, for people who are inside, oh, my apologies, my my light, I didn't I didn't work on that, but I'll, I'll get to that after. Um, so when we're working on messages from from people that are inside, and and trying to get, to get the accurate message across, to get the actual you know what's actually happening, the raw, you know the 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 real rawness that that people inside are actually experiencing the media outlet will matter because I guarantee you if black power media is, is sharing that they're going to share all the details. Black power media is not going to censor, you know, new Africans um, and their experience within prisons and, and the, the, the violence that exists. But when you go to, let's say even a progressive news outlet, like truth out or um, any of these other out, you know, outlets, they're, they're just the same as any liberal outlet when, when it comes down to editing, when it comes down to, you know, the, the message that they're trying to get across, because again, it's their agenda, right? right. It's not our agenda. They have no, they have no, um, what is it called? Uh, 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 allegiance, right? They have no, um, reason, right. To, uh, to actually, you know, to use every word and to, you know, they have, they have no reason for that. Right. Because again, they have their, you know, their, their budgets and they have the, you know, the, the people who actually pay for the platforms to be, to exist and, and they have their own agenda. And it's the same as if you think about nonprofits, you know, of, of sometimes you get silenced and censored because of this. And obviously Jackie and, and, um, Davey, you were all speaking to this, the censorship, right? And so again, it's, it's, it's crucial, right? To have a media outlet that really speaks to the black power aspect of, you know, the, the resistance, right? Because we are here in resistance. We are not here um, to uh, speak, you know, and, 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 and be, and liberalize our messaging, right? We are here in resistance and this exists in resistance and that resistance needs to, to, 
always push forward. This is a protracted struggle and we cannot continue um, to um, be secondary, right? In, in, in the messaging, we have to be primary. We are the primary, we are the primary sources, right? And so that is, 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 is important, right? Because when we are not the primary source, uh, we already know when they're telling our story, uh, just as I spoke about Malcolm X, when they are telling our story, it will be according to what's important to them. And, 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 and it's, it's crucial. So I'll, yeah. I'll yield on that. No, I mean, and, and, and that right there is, is spot on. And I say that because we literally just experienced what you're talking about uh, maybe a couple weeks ago. We, uh, Dr. James and I, we wrote this article and we had to almost battle it out with the particular uh, uh, press that was was pushing it out. I mean, they, they tried to remix. I mean, they, I mean, they did all types of and we had to basically tell them, like, no. Don't use the article if you're not going to do it the way we're talking about, you know. So, I mean, because and, 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 and the, the individual literally told us, like, you know, well, our audience is not going to, you know, they might not, uh, they're not familiar with this and so on and so forth. Listen, we're not writing for your audience. When I write, I make it clear I'm writing for African and colonized people. Period. I support all types of struggles. I am Africa first. And and that's not no, you know, I'm not a, a narrow nationalist or a narrow pan-Africanist. I'm clear that any society is going to support their own first. Any civilized society. That doesn't have to take away. Don't mean I'm not going to help you with yours. But what I look like skipping over mine to go help you with yours. You understand? And and it's like, I mean, they literally, I mean, we had to go, we had to battle with them. Like, listen, like, I don't even believe you even saying that to me. And and to a great extent, we tell folks, listen, I don't just, you know, you like the way I smash at other folks, you can get it too. We open up this can of whip ass, you can taste some too if you like. That's right. You know what I'm saying? We got enough spoons. Anyway, um, Dr. Can I, can, I, can I say something yes. before you jump to Dr. Filet? Um, yes, sir. That's always going to be a battle. And yes. it's a battle because two things come into play. One, uh, people become sometimes addicted and very dependent upon a money source, right? So once that enters into the equation, like, you know, I'll just use you as an example. I'm not saying this is what you do. You got 15 people. You're rolling, you're doing good, you got the platform, and then somebody's like, you know, comes along and puts a condition there, right? right. Uh, right. You know, and the condition may be something that the collective wants, but it's problematic for everybody else that they feel is going to fund your operation, right? So um, that becomes... A thing you often find it sometimes when people will talk progressive, they'll talk revolutionary, and then you say something about Israel and it's a problem. So it's like just leave the Israel thing out, you know, for now. So we can get this money and keep the platform, et cetera, et cetera, because they know there's going to be a clapback. Right. And, and so people make these decisions sometimes around that in those spaces. And then there are other times where people uh, like, look, I'm funding you. I gave you a million dollars, but, you know, you can't talk about my contradictions. You can't talk about, you know, the fact that I'm dancing with R. Kelly and doing all kinds of stuff. So keep that under the rug while I'm giving you this million dollars. And in a sense, I'm giving you money for your silence and your complicity with, with what I'm dealing with. And, and people find themselves often, you know, having to make a decision. I'll give you one example now, Pastor Mike. Um, when I was in the commercial space, we were doing hella shows on sweatshops, right? You know, like, hey, sweatshop this, sweatshop that. We're going hard, had everybody in there. And then Nike came along and bought like a half a million dollars worth of ads. And for the first time ever, my boss pulled me in. He's like, hey, man, you can't, um, you know, I'm going to have to have you to fall back on this. What? It's like, because we got this crazy money in from Nike and they're opening up Nike town and therefore boom, boom, boom. And so it's like, all right, you know, I don't have to do the show. I can talk about other things, right? There's a lot of other issues to fight on. It's like, no, it's not even that, but now you need to interview the president and he has a script he wants you to follow. So now you're sitting there, you know, you got a six figure job, 
you are on a big platform. And a lot of people are depending on the conversations you're having above and beyond this sweatshop thing. What's your, you know, what's the position? So in this case, uh, I agreed not to do it. And we had an unscripted conversation, but we didn't broach the conversation. But I was also in a position to have that deeper conversation on another station. I, you know, I, I was able to go to the hard knock thing and do that. But it's a sacrifice. And, you know, the, and it was a lot dependent. You had interns, the whole nine, right? Do you give up this platform for this one issue? That's not really your bread and butter issue. You know, the sweatshop thing is important, but it ain't the biggest struggle we have. <laughs> You know, and, and I think all of us at one point or other are going to be faced with those type of uh, questions, you know, whether it's intended or not, you know, for, and I'll leave it with this. I know I said this. You're on YouTube right now. Right. We're on these things. And we know that a lot of the technology we, we use results in the exploitation and even the death of our people in the Congo. Do we give that up to be principled and say, you know what, because we know. Let's give up our iPhones and technology computers and we will find another way. Or do we look right. and say, well, you know what? These conversations are important. It might be illuminating life, you know, the issue even bigger. So those are things that, I mean, we wrestle with them. You don't want to sweep it under the rug. But I think there's going to be inherent comp uh, uh, co um, contradictions just from the mere fact that we live in the belly of the beast. There's no way to escape it. And we always got to, you know, figure it out. Hey, in the words of Coco, we confront contradictions. Um, I think for me, it's also about why you get into a situation. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I kind of remind folks that I don't consider myself a self a, a journalist or a podcast, and I respect folks to do that. Um, my goal is is African liberation, and you know, and I respect. I'm not one to just go throw rocks at anyone else for what they're getting into it for but it's like with any relationship you have to be clear what are you getting in this relationship for is it just for us to you know mess around we have a couple you know we we, we call each other for quote unquote booty calls or, or we get married you know what i'm saying what's the situation here you know being a realist about what it is we're doing because sometimes we get caught up in in thinking that we're on the same mission and as 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 they say, everybody that's for the same thing might not be against the same thing. Everybody against the same thing might not be for the same thing. As a owner here at Black Power Media, I struggle with my with my partners. You know what I'm saying? Somewhat regularly. Why? Because we all have different different vantage points and different ways of looking at this thing. You know, my vision might not be the air doctor's vision. You know, so what do we do? You know, how do we deal with that? So we, we we unite in whatever ways we can unite on. And the other ways we, you know, we say, listen, I'm going to go over here while y'all do that. And then I'll be back when y'all finish with that. You understand what I'm saying? And, and that's just it. Keep it moving. You know, but yeah, I definitely, um, you know, unite what you're saying. Um, Dr. Filet, and I, I got to get used to the doctor part because I've been calling you all kinds of stuff for years. But uh, <laughs> what well, is... Uh, always I got so many titles, it's fine, but but do do one of them, mama, doctor, hey, take your pick. But hey, I don't man, like first know. name basis anymore. Oh, the dice. It, I, it, I, I, it I don't gets, even call myself no first name no more. But anyway, go right, ahead. Right, yeah, because no, what happened, because I've been infiltrated at least twice, people, mm. when you try to be very cordial with them or, you know, informal, I've had the experience where they took that and then blew it up and made other people make it seem like they really knew me. Right. And, and then I end up with some other situations based on misrepresentation. So yeah, I, I let people know look. now, unless I know you know you, we ain't doing first name basis. Right on. Talk about it. And, and, I, and I had to do that because, like I said, they, they've infiltrated me at least twice. Right on. Right on. So, but but I'm going to claim my space right now because y'all been like, you know, having good conversation. I'm sitting here going, OK, we try to get you. <laughs> Come on, let's go. <laughs> well, I, I'm ready. And I, like I said, I'm going to claim my space. But um, to, a couple of things. One is, of course, the, as you mentioned, the question around the need for there being black representation, black power. Um, you know, in the 21st century, for a lot of folks to say black power it's like, uh, you, you sound a little archaic. You, you sound a little like, you know. So, so we have to look at dealing with the language and the jargon of things that makes it a bit more palatable 
to a generation and, and not just a generation, to a people who really have been given misinformation about certain things. And so, you know, one of the things I also say is we got to start also dealing with some uh, internal contradictions. And that puts it mildly. And, and so what I say to the sisters, for example, why is it that as black women, who's advocating for Reverend Joy Powell? Hmm. Is she not a political prisoner? I mean, she's not from the 60s or, or thereabouts, but based on her politics and how she got incarcerated, she's a political prisoner. So I'm saying there's some imbalances that we need to examine. One of the things that I created as part of now the Million Woman March Universal Movements is our Million Woman Ministries. Why? So that we could begin to go into the women's prisons. How many groups and organizations go into the women's prisons on a regular basis and talk to the sisters? And so I've been examining these things for the past decade because I'm realizing that there's an imbalance here and I'm talking about not just in terms of uh, our people in general, I'm being very specific. I'm talking about those who talk about being revolutionary, pan Africanist, nationalist, whatever. We have to really begin to look at what the hell we doing or not doing. And again, this is not to, to try to uh, you know, point a finger or anything like that, but, but we definitely need to raise the bar and we need to begin to ask some questions about some things. And with that, in terms of journalism or communications or what have you, I've had a radio program for 14 straight years. I'm on blog talk. I stayed on blog talk, even though I interact with other folks on YouTube, Facebook. We do our own Zoom stuff, put it on Facebook. But I stayed on blog talk for a reason. Why? Consistency is key. I've been on there for 14 straight years independent. I pay for it. Say what I want to say. Now, of course, they can take us off whenever they want, but so far they haven't. And we've had from Chairman Fred to Minister Farrakhan, you name it. But who will promote, promote us amongst our own black media people? And I'm not talking about the mainstream black media people. I'm talking about the independent black media folk because we support them and promote them regardless. See, I have a philosophy. You do what you're supposed to do because you have to answer to the ancestors. Other folks obviously don't really deal with that philosophy and it's okay because we always have and always will. One, I was asked to run for Congress here in Philadelphia after the Million Woman March because white folks realized how important and powerful that was. Two, I've never been invited by any of our black institutions, higher learning, Spelman or whatever, none of them, none of the black historically black colleges. Yet, I'm the founder of the largest gathering in the world of any women, 2.5 million by the way, before Facebook and Instagram and TikTok jock and whatever. Now, we are often challenged, struggle mandates it, that you are confronted with decisions. Sometimes those decisions are tests to see if you're really about what you say you're about. So I was asked to run for Congress. I said, no, nah, uh, uh, no thank you, sir, I'm good. It was an elder here in Philly who they call the, uh, what do they call him? The, the black uh, godfather, that's what they called him. Very, very wealthy. He was behind many of the black politicsters, I'm sorry, black politicians here in Philly, uh, backed them, taught them and so forth. So he pulled me in his office and said, you know, we want to run you for Congress. I said, no, sir, I don't believe so. And he reached back in his chair and he started laughing. He said, oh, you know what? He said, I heard where the police have stopped people and pulled them over and found drugs in their hubcap or in their trunk. Now, I'm new to this game, right? I'm, I've been cultural artist, you know, have my own dance troupe, da, da 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 So this game of politics, I'm new to this now after the Million Woman March. And so he says, so you know, I've heard where these things have happened to people. So because I'm more spiritual than religious or religion, 
I said, well, sir, thank you so much for informing me of that. I said, but you know what? I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't even eat meat. And I'm not gay. So if you all are getting ready to try to set me up, you're going to have to do better than that. Now, note, he made it very clear. If I didn't want to run for Congress, all I need to do is to set up an organization headed up by women and they would pay for it. And I told him no. So he, in, he indirectly threatened me by letting me know that he had enough control and power in this city to stop me at any point that I even thought I wanted. But because I responded to him in the way that I did, this is what he said. He laughed and he said, you know what? I said, what's that, sir? He said, I like you. Go ahead, go ahead. And he let me walk. My point is, when you do things principally, you're going to run into some kind of problem. This either the direct enemy or the peon enemy. Now, note, I'm in Philadelphia. For those of you who know about the boule, oh, it's real. It's not a figmentation of Bob Steve Coakley's imagination. I'm from Philly. I live here. I know these people. I've seen it up close and personal. The blockers, the gatekeepers, you name it. And even the folks that wear dashikis, locks, and other kind of stuff that they send into our community. And believe me, they're good now. Oh, they can quote Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Amos Wilson, Francis Crest. They can tell you all about it. And then go right back to Massa and tell them, well, this is what she's doing. And, and you know what? So I had to learn all of that the hard way. Fortunately, there are a few elders in my life that, you know, allowed me to, to grow and develop, including the, one of the president generals of the UNIA, uh, Ancestor Reedman Battle, uh, Baba Bilal Sunni Ali, Baba Willie Ricks. So I've been able to stay connected with folk who came before me. Now, my point is this. Here, I represent the original woman, at least from every documentation that we have historically, uh, archaeologically, uh, genetically, I represent the original woman, the original black woman. And yeah, I say black for a reason, because I study physics. So you, you never heard of the green hole, the yellow hole, the white hole, but you did hear the black hole in the universe. So I'm not just coming from something of, you know, color that certain people say, oh, you know, the code that they wrote said black mean dead, Negro, please. I was here before all of that and I'm claiming it. So, you know, so, so people have issues and problems with me because again, I've, as Shirley Chisholm said, ain't been bought, can't be sold, none of that. But that's a problem even amongst us who claim to be about self-determination. Kuchichangalia is something that folks talk about at Kwanzaa time. Some of us live it. Million Woman March, how did it get started? Do you know? Nope. Never took the time to find out. We allowed the enemy to lessen something of that magnitude. Where did you ever hear Malcolm X's daughters, Congressman Maxine Waters, Congressman John Conyers, Sister Soldier, Jada Pickett Smith, Dr. Dorothy Height, Mother Winnie Mandela, a message being spoken in English and Spanish sent by Sister Asada Shakur. Now, if that didn't tell people what we were about, what I was about, then you either hallucinating or just stupid. So why would we not get the support afterwards? Here we have folks who are doctorates in finance or business which I won't name them now, the city of Philadelphia made at least $25 million off of my baby. Now, that wasn't my plan, and I definitely didn't get none of it, but because they have to provide reports, they did, and said that it was an, at least $25 million generated. Why would not our black economists, financial folk, investors, get on the phone and say, sis, let's talk? Never happened. But why was I invited by MIT to come speak there? 
but yet none of the historically black or African departments. And I'm right here in Philly with the person who started Afrocentricity. My point is, we got to deal with some internal contradictions. So as we talk about media and, and communications and so forth, let's connect those black dots and realize that even amongst us that talk about how we need to be independent, what do we embrace that is independent for real? And then when you see that being built, to what degree do we actually support that? And so when we look at our women in particular, and, and if I asked any of you right now, what black woman is representing us as a people, but also advocates in terms of our women? Because I, I wanna just do something, if I may take one minute, I have pulled it up a few moments ago, but I wanna remind y'all of something, and it's this. Oh, hold on, let me let me cue this up again. We we can only see a pen. But can you hear it? Uh, no, we can't, can't hear anything. I don't know. Can you all hear something? Okay. Can you hear it now? Okay. Okay, so why would Brother Malcolm 50 plus years ago make it a point to have to say the most disrespected entity on the planet is the black woman? So here's my point. And, and by the way, for the record, I'm not a feminist. I don't need to be, I'm the mother of civilization. So all that other little title stuff and all of that, I'm not into none of that. We've been accused of that. And, and that was because people were punks and, w and didn't want to stand up and fight back or help us. They were afraid of their own shadow in, in one regard. My point is, we've got to deal with not just the conversation about independent media and communications, but even with one another. How are we being real, independent, and on point with that? We talk about the enemy, which we should, and we will continue to do so, we must. But we've also got to begin to look at some realities within our own self. And as the sister talked about contradictions, I'm here to say, yo, I'm a perfect example. What we did in 97 has never been done. Million Man March, yes, we applauded it, we supported it. Mr. Farrakhan also supported us. I'm not in the nation. But my point is we were able to get folks from all across the board at that time because it was hype. But afterwards, we could not get the support because I could not be controlled. And the people that saw this would not step up to get my back. So now what I've learned to do is to create my own. So right now, um, I don't have it in front of me, but, but I'm the editor of a black newspaper. Sister, you're in Baltimore. Are you familiar with the National Black Unity News paper? Well, it does yeah. exist. Yeah, it is I, online. I'm one paper. of the editors. It's well, both hard DC, copy. But right. Yes. But see, my point is we won't support our own stuff. I'm in Philly. We are now going to make sure that that paper, and a black man started that paper, and it is truly independent. There ain't nothing white up in there. And they ain't getting no grant. And by the way, I've never had a grant, never had corporate sponsoring. So even though, again, the Million Man March definitely was in, in beautiful, I wasn't Minister Farrakhan. Nobody knew me. 
How did the million woman march get started? With my money. Initially, I had a shop here in Philadelphia. So my point is, you know, we don't even keep our own history. We, we don't have much, especially when it comes to the women. And we have to deal with that reality. So again, the National Black Unity News, you can get it online or you can get a hard copy. So we're gonna see how many black folks is gonna support that when we initiate our own section in that paper. We're asking people to advertise with us. I have a new slogan. Support the righteous and the divine USA, United Sisters of Africa. You see, we're gonna do business now. Because I realized just asking people to support, that ain't going to get it. So now I've created a network. We have sisters in Cameroon, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa. We're getting ready with the brother from the National Black Unity newspaper. He's going to help us do the virtual stuff. We're putting a marketplace online that will feature sisters who make their own everything. Shoes, bags, jewelry. We're creating our own international network, both in terms of information, because we're now also working with the folks from the Nat Turner Library. We'll be there in August for the Nat Turner celebration of the insurrection. But they are printers, publishers. So the brother link. came out of the nation. Yes. Do you have a link? We can put it in the uh, put it in the uh, uh, check if you pull okay we'll do we'll do out. but um, but my point is here we have entities that have substantial valuable things contributions let's see how we will support those things we already know what the enemy is and is not going to do right. what are we going to do what apparatuses are we developing to make certain that we can move forward and bring this next generation forward. And lastly, the Million Woman World March is gonna happen in October. It will be the first of three. This one will be in the US, the second one will be in one of the Caracom countries, which will be next year, and the third one will be in Africa in 2025. We're getting ready to close out next year of what? The international decade for African people. Where are black women in the US in that picture? Where's the representation for us as women? And why do I say that? Because who is it that has the children primarily for the first four to five years, including the first nine months? So realistically speaking, if we're not talking about nurturing and bringing forward our women, then what are we talking about in terms of the children? So some of this is just basic stuff. So again, from a communication standpoint, what are we talking about? How are we talking about securing what we have and then taking it to the next level? How are we talking about making certain that we can educate our people and not just virtually or using these platforms that we have, but also how are we bringing those platforms together? What other collectives are we putting together to assure that this broadcast, Thorough Black Talk, I work with a brother who has Africa on the move, how are we synchronizing those things to bring them together and then sharing them with the masses? We talk to one another. How are the Thanks. masses of our people getting this information? How have we thought about that happening? Well, Again. Here. This, this is do. what we've got to look at. Go yeah, ahead, Brother cool. Kalaji. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna send you your send you my invoice because you did a commercial. <laughs> but otherwise, uh we uh definitely I unite with what you're talking about, and, and that's kind of the efforts we've been attempting to make, not just on um, you know, uh, you know, the podcast situation, we're moving into uh publishing books, films, mm -hmm. etc., to uh create uh, communication. That is our goal with Black Power Media. And, and one thing I, I want to clarify with folks too, because I, I, I definitely heard what you said in regards to the whole Black Power slogan. Part of the reason that we decided to name it Black Power Media 
was because of the fact that we feel that so often people take things and they uh, they bastardize the meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. So you say certain things and you turn them into negative connotations like hotel. You know what I'm saying? Folks say, oh, you're a hotel. <laughs> hotel means peace. So, you know, then it means that. Right. Well, you're the woke community, so on and so forth. So for us, black power is not simply, you know, wearing some dusty ass uniforms and, and boots and just screaming out uh, black power in a powerless room. That's right. For us, we're talking about nationhood. We're talking about sovereignty. We're talking about controlling our own destiny. And I think that that's one of the things that even some of the folks on our platform are unclear about. You know, I'm just going to put it out there because it is not for entertainment purposes only. It is mm -hmm. not for, that's not, that's not my goal. You know right. what I'm saying? I, I'm interested in our, our liberation. So whatever, you know, of course, Malcolm popularized the whole by any means necessary piece. But of course, we know that, you know, Europeans, they came with by any means necessary to conquer, mm -hmm. to destroy, to slaughter um, and to control. So for us, if we're going to utilize, like they say, a wise man utilizes all tools, we have to be able to take whatever piece of equipment that we can and turn it into make it work in the best interest of our people. Um, with that being said, I definitely appreciate you all coming on today. I would like to, uh, you know, ask you all to give us some closing words on your thoughts as to what we can do better as far as uh, creating a propaganda arm, because propaganda is is a weapon, is a tool. And like with all the things that with uh, uh, Dr. Filet just pointed out, it is that propaganda that it ends up being. If we're not you know, we can have some of the greatest tools in the world. We we all know plenty of excellent singers. We know some of the, the best chefs, the best fighters. I know some cats, you know, back where I'm from that, that literally got that one headed quitter. You know what I'm saying? They, you know, a lot of these boxes that we talk about wouldn't stand a chance. But as my brother Balogun points out, if you don't know a thing, then it doesn't exist. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It sounds good in theory. I could talk about how many lions I got in the backyard. You're like, you ain't got no lions. You know what I'm saying? If you can't show and prove, then it don't mean anything. So mm -hmm. propaganda is a tool that we must use in order to advance. I appreciate folks like Davey and, 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 and Jackie for taking unconventional, using unconventional methods because you know, I'm sure that, you know, folks going to give you slack because it's always easier to criticize, to critique than to build. You know what I mean? We get folks in the chat all the time talking about what we need to do. I get folks that right. tell me about myself. They don't even know who they talking about, who they talking to. <laughs> I get folks telling me about folks who I learned directly <laughs> from, who I roll with. And we have situations and they tell you, you need to talk to see the such and such know you said it. Yeah, I'm the one who told him, but it's all good. It ain't right. really tripping on that. You know, the reality is we have to be able to um, form functional unity. We have to make it practical. I think that one of the the uh, the, the side effects of colonialism and imperialism is it puts us in a competitive mode. It puts us in the uh, in the in the uh, space where we're questioning. As, as the rapper would say, who got the biggest slaves and I mean, who got the biggest chains mm. and the flyest whips? You know what I'm saying? It's like we embrace our oppression and we embrace not being able to work together. Like I said, I always make an effort to create a situation to organize the organizers. You know what I'm saying? That is always my goal. You know, with the FTP movement, Seattle movement, it's not one organization. It is folks who know that we look, this is your skill set. Boom. This is what I do over here. You good at what you do. I'm good at what I do. Let's make this thing work. You know what I'm saying? People say, you know, sometimes, oh, man, that's a piece of cake. Not even a piece of cake is a piece of cake. When you think of what it took to grow the 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 wheat or the, you know what I'm saying, the, the eggs and everything that comes with cake, the sugar cane, so on and so forth. A piece of cake ain't even a piece of cake. But it's that collective work. We can come together and bake a cake, but coming together to move a nation is 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 kind of 
a different space. So um, let's start with you, Coco. We can go uh, uh, clockwise. Jackie, I don't know if you're still with us. I see your cameras. I know you said you had a problem with your, uh, your piece. If you're not, we appreciate Jackie Lupman always for bringing us a uh, practical solution and, 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 and observing the situation and getting, giving us a clarity from her vantage point out in DC. So definitely we appreciate that. But Coco, what's your, uh, in closing, what do you feel we can do? How do we build a black power media? You know, it's not just a word. It's not just, you know, this particular front, you know, and I, I use that title because to me, this is what's necessary. It's not about what we're doing, but it's about what we're doing collectively. How do we bring this to the forefront? What can we do? Yeah, you mentioned the very important word um, that I am a, a I am a revolutionary nationalist, right? I'm a new African nationalist, right? And so nation is such an important aspect of the work that I do, right? And and what often leads me in the work that I do, right? My principles, my values. And so, you know, when I think about, you know, the work that we're trying to do and, and, and the focus, right, of the work that we're trying to do, I feel like that's extremely important when, um, you know, trying to um, remember, right, who, we, who our audience is, who we are trying to speak to, who are we trying to organize, right, and, and, and keeping that focus as, you know, it, the other is not necessary. It's not the primary. It's not the important, right? There, you know. And I think a lot of times, you know, even myself, you know, um, when you get caught up in like who you're trying to speak to or appeal to, right? When when we get caught up in that, right? Appealing to, um, you know, the so-called black left or appealing to the so-called um, masses, right? We have to we have to understand the class differences amongst ourselves. We have to understand you know, various aspects. And so when we, when we're thinking about media and, and black power within media, right, we have to recognize, in my opinion, recognize, you know, the nation of new African people, right? Um, and most people would just say African or black. Um, I specifically say new African. Um, but in this case, you know, just recognizing, you know, us as a nation of people, right? And, and, and what we're trying to build, right? Because this is not, you know, we, I am not a part of the oppressor nation. I, I am not, you know, a, a, a so-called American, right? And so the American, the, the fascist agenda is not my agenda, right? And so, you know, always remembering who I'm, I'm trying to struggle for, right, in resistance with is, is at the forefront of, you know, the work that I'm trying to do and, and always remembering that, right? There is no funding, right? I don't, I don't, I don't have like, you know, um, Mama Fele was, was saying, there's no funding, there's no grants, you know, although I do, you know, work in, in, um, in, in some form of capacity of grassroots work that I, I do have, you know, and we have, we, we have to find alternative ways to support ourselves, right? And so that includes the media, right? And so even more important is if when we want to see this type of media and this type of platform, if we want to have it to continue to exist or any type of independent media, we need to actually support, right? And that means we need to, you know, support with our money, right? We need to support with our resources, our time, right? We need to support with a lot. And, and we also have to share that information, right? We have to share the news outlets and the, and the various um, forms of media that is, is, is speaking about, you know, the same uh, uh, agenda, right? And not just continuously, you know, only supporting the the American agenda, right? And so the the liberal media and the you know even the prog so called progressive media, right? We have to recognize that there is different struggles, right? And and their struggle is not my struggle, right? I, I don't call myself a leftist. I I try I strive to stay away from the abolitionist term, and I I stick to the fact that I am a new African nationalist, and and I am here to build and to to engage in nation building. And so that, that focus, you know, again, where we support and who we support does matter if we want to continue the resistance and when we want to continue to propagate and, and, and actually, you know, maintain a message, um, we, we definitely need to continue to support. And so black power media is essential uh, among other, 
um, outlets that are that exist that we have. I've I learned today of a new outlet that I didn't even know existed. Right. <laughs> Mama Fale, thank you. Um, so I think, again, it's, it's really important, you know, to really to have these conversations and to come together and to really, again, focus who we are speaking to and, and, and make sure that we don't get sidetracked just because there might be some funding or some, you know, people that we think we like. Right. Because that's not that that's not important here. Right. It's not about being liked. It's not about liking. Right. It's about the message that's that's, again, our resistance and why we are fighting and what we're trying to achieve. Right. We have a common objective. Right. And in, in, in my in my regard and what um, Brother Malcolm always said as 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 nationalists, it's for land and independence. Right. And, and right. to make sure we maintain that line of, of understanding. This is not about infiltrating or getting within within right? The, the oppressor nation's political sphere, right? It's about our own nation and building our own people up, right? And decolonizing ourselves and our own people. And so we have to maintain that line. We have to continue to push against the liberalism that does come within, right? The liberalism will seep in. It happens all the time, right? I see it in in many spaces, mm -hmm. right? And we have to we have to confront those contradictions because if we don't, we will continue, continue um, to be repressed as as we are. So, I'll leave at that. Hey, that that was uh, yes, yes, definitely appreciate that, man. That was uh, it, it's 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 necessary, you know, in in on all levels. So definitely appreciate uh what you just dropped because we we have to remember, you know, the purpose. You know what's the key ingredient in, in in what it is we're we're looking to serve, Jackie. You back with us before you cut out again. Jackie got shiny. She was pro black a little while ago. You got to <laughs> you gotta check when you, <laughs> you cut out. Yeah, Putin. Putin. <laughs> Rooting, tooting, Putin. What's going on? <laughs> no, you know, I, I often think of how. Um, we we throw out you know this phrase very often you know join an organization and 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 I think it is incredibly important to understand why that is why we say to people you know look it's one thing to be to get you know your information from Black Power Media or Lukman Nation you know or or you know a Black Unity News and or or you know David D's programs um, that is one thing to get your information from Black radical sources that's great. But I want to know what you're doing with it. I yeah. want to know what it is you're doing with the organ, with the information that you get from us. Because if all people are doing is coming to these platforms, wherever they are, whatever they are, and you know, lobbing whatever criticisms they have, and and I understand that as a people, nobody listens to us. So to have a place where we can come and air whatever grievances ideas that's very very important for the cultural development of a people but if that is all we are doing and we are not taking that information and truly building a nation doing nation building from the ground up grassroots what are you doing with the information you get from us because i i you know as somebody who I literally fell into this journalism thing, not even it being something that I set out to do. It was really just something that came out of me being politically curious, being politically active, not liking the politics of this nation and where we are as a people in relation to the politics of this nation. And it wasn't even a situation where I just happened to meet somebody who was the same as I was. No, I was put together with that dude by the ancestors. I am convinced of this. Ain't no way we got together and that wasn't true. We couldn't have made this up if we tried. I was put together with somebody so that we could go along this path. So I feel like in a way I'm doing what I was I was ordered to do by the ancestors. I'm asking people who watch me continue to do the, to, to the best I can 
what I'm what I've been ordered to do. I am living out my marching orders from the ancestors. I know I'm not the only person the ancestors have given marching orders to. So I'm wondering what y'all who have been watching us, what y'all doing? Are y'all taking the information that you're getting from black radical media outlets, whatever they are, whoever they are, from wherever you find them? Are you actually doing nation building? Or are you doing what Coco has said? Are you just, you know, propping up people that you like and, and using it as, you know, uh, entertainment? You know, what Kalanji said, is it just entertainment for you? Because if that's what you equate black media, black independent radical media to, if you equate it to entertainment, then I don't think that we are failing in our job. I think you're failing in yours. Because we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We are the voice of black radical expression. However we see and we feel that we are being directed to be that voice for, for whatever and however we're doing it. We, those of us you're seeing on this screen and, and those of us we are connected to, we're, we're following our orders. What y'all doing? That's I really need to know because as much information as we give you, as much clarity and enlightenment as we give you into not just the current politics of the day, but of the history of our movements that got us to this point that we're not going to hear anywhere else, but unless it comes from us, if you're not doing anything to build a free and independent Black nation with that information, then honestly, all you've done is relegate us to another kind of entertainment. And I, I hate to, to sound kind of petty about it, but I really feel like I have to be in defense of our work. That's on you. Because for those of us with no money, because honestly, I be, being an employee of Sputnik, I'm still at the mercy of whatever the U.S. government decides to do if they ever figure out a way to shut us down. And they're still trying. But I would still do this from the studio in our house that we set up, even if I didn't get a paycheck from Sputnik or, any, or anybody else. So if we're willing to do this with the little bit of resources that we have at our disposal, what are you willing to do with the resources that you have with the information that we're sacrificing to give you? I got to ask that question because you're a part of this nation building too. And if you're not holding up our end, there's no use in, in condemning or critiquing or, or saying whatever you have to say about the independent sources that give you the information that is literally the ammunition to build a nation if you're not doing what you should be doing to help us do it. So what y'all doing to build well, a nation? Let me ask you this, Jackie. Can I borrow like five dollars and a piece of sweet potato pie? <laughs> I give you five dollars. I don't know if you want to eat that. I'm I'm one of those black women who has not mastered the art of the sweet potato pie. Jackie, I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't play with the sweet potato pie. I, I don't play. That. I, I, I I fit in. I, I fit in where I know I can do well. I I loan you some money, but but I can't I can't cook no pie. Say less. Sorry. Say less. <laughs> Right. We we damn sure ain't gonna get David to do the sweet potato pie. So David D, what's what's what, what, what's your last words, my brother? Okay, well, first of all, make sure you have raisins in the sweet potato pie, and that's gonna oh, take it over the top. There you go. <laughs> Even I wouldn't do that. Good lord, brother. But I do. You been in Oakland too long. Yeah. Man. Um, let me say a couple of things. One, um, I appreciate that you know you were able to execute a vision you and Jared and Kamal and everybody, and you have uh, this network. It shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, and you should stick to your guns and, and stay on your square, so to speak. Um, with that being said, you know, we have a number of challenges in front of us. One, uh, the audience that you talk to and the potential audience that I think you and all of us would ideally would like to reach. We're in competition um, and very um, unbridled 
unapologetic competition. Uh, folks know that capturing the young minds and, and, and minds that are not fully politically acclimated are up for grabs. And they will entertain them. They'll seduce them. They'll coerce them. They'll manipulate. Um, they will use all the shiny tools uh, that they can. It, it, it might have started off with uh, MySpace and lived and moved on to Facebook, to IG, to TikTok, and whatever things that they do. I mean, I know that just from teaching, you know, and I do my orientations with my college students. And I can tell you, most do not listen to radio. They don't even watch TV half the time. You know, their stuff is coming off. As one sister proudly told me, I get my stuff off TikTok, right? And there's a whole network of information sources that she feels is enlightening her to do what she does. And she has a strong, uh, just using her as an example, she has a, a strong political analysis that, you know, we all may find somewhat flawed, but it's hers. And she rolls with it and she's 21 years old. And she has a bunch of 21 year olds that think that way. And and so I understand that. And with that being said, I, I, I come back to um, places like yours are a consistent source that should be there. Now the question is how can we um, do a dance that makes sense? There are many levels um, to a fight. There are many um, approaches to a fight. Um, there are many ways in which we operate. You know, some of it is determined by geography. Some of it is uh, determined by our experience. Some of it is determined by, you know, our political orientation. You know, not everybody's going to hold the same politic as strictly as you do. And we also have to recognize whether we like it or not. Some of this is entertainment because that's how we've been raised. You know, news is entertainment. You know, all of it, you know, who got killed, who got shot, who died in the hurricane is a form of entertainment. And I can tell you that from Clear Channel from the studies that we did, you know, you know, take advantage of those million dollar studies and uh, uh, things like that. So that's there. I think we work in tandem when we can. We try to um, reference each other, try to use uh, and expose those resources to other audiences if we're in that position. Um, you know, like I come to you a lot of times, you know, Kalanji, who do you think would be good? It's strategic. I can get, I mean, you know, I get, I get a newsletter and I'm on the list for all sorts of stuff, the Democratic Party and the DLC and all kinds of people have folks that they offer up very easily to talk about issues of the day. And I make a decision to be like, I want to find out here, you know, whether it's Cop City or whatever, because I know the politic and it's my job to facilitate a conversation and make sure an audience understands two things. One, that your perspective is just as legit as the one that they see on CNN, MSNBC and anything else that they may have turned into. So that's important and that's also very strategic. I also think that many of our strategies shouldn't be discussed online. We should have you know, off the grid conversations. Um, if that means pulling a coattail, then do that off the line, you know, not on it. Um, and I think we do that pretty well. Hey, man, let me tell you about this. What do you think about that? Um, who do you recommend? Those types of conversations uh, work best. And then um, and then we work in tandem. So um, what people may perceive is like, well, this is an Oakland thing and they're an Atlanta thing. Yeah, but we know each other and we kind of try to, you know, complement what we're doing, knowing damn well that there are people that will immediately and very strategically try to divide, you know, and, and so we have to be careful of that. Um, I would say that um, we have these tools and you use every tool to your advantage, you know. Um, I certainly do. I'm not afraid to go on social media and do the dance. As you know, I mean, I've been getting into the AI stuff. You know, that's a tool on to itself. If for anything, it saves me money because now I don't have to get sued like we did before by posting somebody's pictures, make my own damn pictures and take my own pictures. And I share them with everybody. You know, I mean, it could be something as simple as that because, you know, the moves that we make are things that are potentially upsetting. And folks will want to try to find out how can we um, disrupt that. And so, um, you know, where I'll close with this, why I sit there's a lot of people attempting to, and in many cases, actually doing some of the things I think we desire. And, you know, we should be aware of those networks and, 
and 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 um, uh, projects that people are undertaking, and you know, align ourselves or at least you know be aware of, so that when um, things pop up, be like, hey, you know what, Jared got a show with Daruba. If you're watching the Tupac thing, maybe you need to watch, you know, you need to do that. Maybe we can take that and highlight that or strategically reference, you know, what's going on. If sister over here is doing work with political prisoners, well, that's another person that we can reference, you know, and it goes on and on down the, down the, down the road. I don't think there's going to be a one size fits all type of situation. I don't think there is a, a magic bullet. I think um, I, I give room for people to have their differences, some of them glaring, some of them more nuanced. Um, but I try to support wherever I can. That's my commitment and promise to this endeavor. And and so I appreciate what you all are doing. And, you know, you know, you always have my support on air and off air. So thank you. Uh, definitely. Thank you, Davey. Um, and make sure you all check out Hard Knock Radio. Um, I know uh, Oakland, Atlanta, New York. Uh, no, not New York, but you know, all up and down the West Coast. They, and they kicked you out of New York, man. What's happening? <laughs> I don't know. We, I don't think you, we ever been on here. How you get yeah. kicked out of New York? But anyway, definitely. Uh, it, it's I appreciate your show because it, it is a is a quality piece and it's well produced as well. It's not just you know, um, it's just talking for the sake of talking. So I definitely appreciate it. Appreciate the words. And as you stated, it's it's always good to be able to uh, bounce off of each other as far as like. Uh, you know, creating somewhat of an underground uh, railroad where, OK, boom, we need to push this particular piece. So, you know, oftentimes folks don't even know we know each other in these different arenas. And it's good that way sometimes. You yeah, know? they don't so, need to know. <laughs> yeah. And we, we're able to cut down on, on yeah. bullshit because on, 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 on several occasions you may cause like, you know, somebody named such and such. Yeah, run. Yeah, <laughs> I know that's Wait, right. I, I'm about to come grab your hand, Doctor yeah. Fillet. <laughs> what we got from your closing words, and, and give wow. us the real version. Last time you tried to put it all in. We... <laughs> okay, so you. Go ahead. okay, um, and for some reason when I'm on, I don't know why my time is, ends up getting shortened, but I'm gonna figure that out a little later <laughs> on. But anyway, two things. Up. Two things. One, we often talk about Suntas, the, the art of war. And I always look at what are we looking at this comes from us by us. So I'm writing several books now. One of them is called The Art of Struggle. Mm. Um, what we realize is that we have to now look at this situation from a holistic approach. So as each one of us have talked about different areas of things that we focus on or whatever, one thing that MWM has been able to do now as the first global movement for women and girls of African descent is to walk in true bubblegum at the same time. And what that means is we've been able to, in this past decade in particular, to critique various areas and then not just talk about here's the problem. And then I know that all of you are doing something, but what we've begun to do now is to introduce what we feel are at least potential solutions or something for folks to think about. For example, now, given what you just said, or what all of us have just said, um, I'm a strategist in addition to being a tactician amongst other things. And I have to now say this because if I don't say it, nobody else will. So I have to start writing my own stuff because I thought that folks would look at things and say, wow, this is how, this is how, let's write about, no. I don't get invited to programs. I don't get invited to conferences and all of that. So now I got to do my own stuff, right? So one of my books, The 100 Amazing Facts About the Million Woman March. Why? Nobody else wants to write about it. I guess I'd better. So I don't know if you can see my T-shirt. Malcolm X, we, we created an entity called We Charge Genocide 21. Most folks here in Philadelphia didn't even know that the great Paul Robeson took the petition to the United Nations in 1951 that we call We Charge Genocide. So I began to introduce that to more folk, and now more people talk about it, but we created an actual project plan of action. So in July, we'll be hosting our annual Queen Mother Moore Weekend. We connected it to We Charge Genocide 21, because we have 21 areas of crimes against humanity. 
but utilizing Brother Malcolm, who taught us in 64 when he went to Africa to talk to the African Union and other heads of state that we need to examine the human rights violations of our people in the U.S. And he went to them to ask for support, et cetera, et cetera. So we combine these models, making sure that people know Cali House, who we now call St. Cali House. Because when we do the Queen Mother Moore weekend, we will also begin the installment of at least 25 sister saints. So again, how do we begin to re-educate, deprogram our own people simultaneously as we're addressing the issues, we gotta come up with plans of action. So we introduced the BBB Co, which will be launched this month in recognition of one of our other sister saints, Madam C.J. Walker, who exemplified being able to take your own money and create capital, for lack of a better word. The point is, it was a strategic mindset that was introduced. It was Avon that took the same concept and applied it to their salespersons. But they looked at uh, Annie Malone and Madam C.J. Walker, and then they structured that which became very successful. What are we doing that takes our ancestors' work and then apply it to today? So with this BBB Co coming from MWM, in terms of communications, the Million Woman March brought two million people together physically, not during the time of fake book and all of that. How do we get the message out? How are you able to generate that kind of input literally bringing people together when there was no social media. We didn't already have an existing organization. How do we get the word out? Well, I'm gonna share that with you now in my book, 100 Amazing Facts, but also to bring it up to date. The BBB Co is one of our new units. Why? We know we can't depend on really any media, at least from my experiences, in the past two decades. So I had to create my own apparatus. This month, the BBB Co will be launched nationwide. What is it? It's one of our new membership components that consists of beauticians, braiders, barbers, and cosmetologists, the BBB Co. And usually when I say to somebody, we are starting the BBB Co, they wanna know what's that? Because I've already put in their psyche, B Co, B Co. Deco, what am I talking about? I'm talking about taking a well-known unit in our community that usually from my research indicates two people in your household is usually going to one of those people at least once a month. Who are one of those people? The beautician, the braider, the barber, or the cosmetologist. So if your person in your household is going to one of those persons that are black owned, independent. What could happen if our information is put into each of the beautician barter braiders shops? Am I depending on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok doc? No, because the person that's coming to that shop has access to our information which is how the Million Woman Watch was able to generate and matriculate what we wanted people to know because we were smart enough to put it in the community first without depending on mass media. So my point is we don't look at examples that are right in front of our own eyes. So now we've taken those things and put it into a formation of modes of operations. So we ask now people when they tell us, well, I'm black, I'm this and this, that, I tend to ask, what do you support that's independent? What do you support that literally is building a nation or supporting nations? Because that's where the buck meets the road or the rubber, as they say. When you can tell somebody, this is what I do to support independent nations or or those that are really doing independent self-determination types of work. What do you act, What are you actually doing? What are you actually supporting? These are the questions that we now raise. So in July, from the 27th to the 30th, we'll be doing the Queen Mother Moore weekend. Raising some of these questions, but also introducing what we call our own declaration of self-determination. 
as MWM now moves into the modality of the formation of first new societies. This is important when you understand the history of the US and others. Liberation movements in the early 17, 1800s, I'm sorry, 1800s in particular, they formed societies. I'm here in Philly where one of the first African free society was formed. So strategically speaking, you look at history to uh, how you can develop modes of operations that's gonna take you to the next level and use those as a foundation. It allows people to become more acclimated to what you're doing and saying by giving them that historical significance of something that they may be familiar with. So we first create independent societies nationwide. Then we start looking at how to develop further nations. We first support the ones that exist or are striving to exist, the RNA, the Republic of New Africa, and, and a few others, they're already there. How are we supporting the existing independent nations or those striving to be an independent nation and or organ? My point is the conversations are great and we need that and we should continue. But those who have been in this movement kind of already know certain stuff and we're not gonna keep regurgitating that. We have to develop plans of action. Lastly, with that said, well, I want to make sure that people know, um, for me, I always tell people I've never been a Negro in the context that, you know, people talk about in terms of house Negroes and stuff like that. Because when I was in first grade, I got kicked out of Catholic school. I didn't know nothing about black, nothing about Africa. I just knew whoever was standing before me, I didn't like it. And I didn't have no connection about nothing. But I knew I did not like the system of white, well, what we call white supremacy. I call it off-white. The point is now we have the capability to identify ourselves and we must. And to some degree, at some point, that is gonna come to nationality. But this straddling the fence thing, it has got to stop in the 21st century. And we can no longer allow people to do that. And then we co-sign their nonsense by not speaking truth to power. Well, guess what? Some of us are here to do that. And we will use every tool and apparatus to make certain that we expose this BS amongst ourselves as we are simultaneously kicking the system of white supremacy off white supremacy back where it needs to be with them. But again, strategic modes of operations are important. And please no longer talk to me about warrior queens of the past if you're not ready to deal with the ones right here today, right in your face. I'm done. Hey, man. It's Dr. Filet in the building. Y'all better act like y'all know somebody that knows somebody if you don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, this Queen Mother Moore weekend. Uh, that's powerful. We will definitely be pushing that on this platform as necessary because Queen Mother Moore doesn't get enough recognition right. like so many others uh uh women freedom fighters one uh a couple here who were my teachers fulani suni ali we raised her up you know because you know she was a a true warrior a true freedom fighter one of the reasons i'm even here in atlanta georgia um and also uh our good sister sister courage down here you know what i'm saying uh you know yeah. we want to make sure that we we always remember her. And Jerry. Yes. And Mama Jerry, and Jerry. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. The one thing she I love. She did security about... for me, Brother Kalanji. For the Million Woman yeah. March, she was she was on my security detail. And one quick yeah. thing about what you just said. I spoke with Sister Dequi, uh mm -hmm. Odinga, and yeah. she's assisting me in, because, you know, I said, as I said, we're doing the Million Woman World March. A part of that is a tribute to what we call real mothers, daughters, sisters of the movements. Mm. Because right now, the idea of mothers of the movement, I don't know if y'all know or heard about that, but that's some trickery. And it's not mm. to take anything away from sisters who have lost uh, loved ones, etc. but there's really some confusion or ambiguity about that. So we've created mothers, daughters, sisters of the movements so that we can highlight uh, Mama Afini, 
uh, of course, uh, you know, Harriet Tubman, all of the mothers of the movement, uh, Mamie Till. Uh, we have to make certain that we make things clear, as Brother Malcolm told us, make it plain. So again, in October, we'll be introducing what we call real mothers, daughters, sisters of the movement. Right on. So we definitely going to have you back on because uh, this information is pertinent and necessary. Um, you, you, need, you need your own show on Black Power Media, but we'll talk <laughs> about that later. Um, I, I definitely appreciate uh, the four of you for coming on and, and joining uh, me today and joining the audience. I think it was a definitely a, a smorgasbord, for lack of better words, <laughs> of, uh, of Blackness. And I think that one of the things that we don't do is Sometimes we try to uh, get folks on that all agree on all the same things. And that is, uh, you know, to me, that's that's silly. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. because we can't talk about building a nation. We can't talk about nationhood. And we think that all the people that we're around are going to think and move like we do. If that was the case, there'd be no black power media. You know, mm -hmm. so that is that is the reality. Thank you all for your works, your efforts, your energy. Um, it ended up being a little bit longer than, than I expected. Uh, Davey just waking up, so I'm glad, uh, you know, he's good now. <laughs> but, um, you know, Coco, uh, Jackie, um, Dr. Filet, you know what I'm saying? The rest of y'all, I'll call y'all by y'all first name. I don't care what you say. Can't be nothing about it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, Mr. Davey D, because he's my elder. But anyway, y'all be safe. Love y'all. Stay on point. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to future dialogue. Peace. 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 Yes, Peace. checking out RSTV. This Peace. is your favorite uh, platform on BPM. You didn't know it yet, but I'm just going to say it. But um, we definitely appreciate you all supporting what it is we're doing. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Also, um, I want to point out, too, I actually have some exclusive content on my own platform, which is... Uh, uh, at Kalanji Changa on YouTube. We have some uh, new material that'll be coming out that'll be somewhat exclusive. So make sure you follow us over there as well and stay tuned to what's going on here at BPM. We have, uh, I believe we may have an episode of um, Daughters of the Whirlwind tonight. I believe it's 6 p.m. So tune in for that. Uh, tomorrow we're back with the Remix Morning Show. Um, and you know, we have plenty of things coming up. So stay tuned, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And we will see you in the whirlwind right here. Black Power Media. Stay tuned. Stay alive. Keep running. And, um, you know, till next time. Stay ready for revolution. <laughs>